Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on air number 12 and there's seven questions. But first of all, it's Namo, Tasso, Bhagavato, Arahato, Samma Sambuddhasa. Worthy, honorable, and perfectly self-enlightened. This is the best Buddha. Question number one. What is Sankar Upekanyana? Can a person achieve it? Uh, Sanka Upeka, Sankara, what is Sankara? Sankara means to put together, uh, sun together, kara, do, put together. So it's constructions. It's usually uh, translated as formations. That's not too bad, but I think there's an active component in it. So it's a better word is constructions. What is not a construction? Everything is in a construction because it's, it's an interplay between the physical world and the mental world. And so this is something that goes together, that is put together, built like a house of various parts. So it's a, it's a construction. It doesn't exist. Any part of it doesn't exist by itself. It's underpinned by other parts. So the physical world is underpinned by the mental world and the mental world is underpinned by the physical world. Just to name an example. Upekka means uh, equanimity or serenity, but equanimity is, is a better word in this regard. What is equanimity? It's neither sadness nor gladness. It's neither pain nor pleasure. It's something in between. Jnana, knowledge. So it's the knowledge or the experience of having equanimity regarding the world, the entire world, both the internal world and the external world. Can a layperson achieve that? Yes, one can. How can you achieve this? It's very, it's a very, you can say, agreeable. You cannot call it pleasant, uh, pleasant knowledge or pleasant experience because uh, it's upekka is defined as being neither pleasure nor pain, neither sadness nor gladness. So you cannot call it pleasure, but you can say it's agreeable. It's filled as peace. If one sees, ah, th this is impermanent, and therefore this is suffering, therefore this is no self, that outside there, that world outside there, that's also impermanent. That's also suffering, therefore. That also has no substance, no everlasting substance in it. So it's, it's not real, it's not unreal, but it's definitely not satisfying. It's unsubstantial. Then, one is this sad to see that no it's not sad it's very realistic it's something that you have to take the bullet by the horns say ah this is suffering it's not mine it's not me it's just a frame i'll lose it again that also is suffering it's not not my world i'm not a part of that world so one redirects attention towards nibbana by doing that, one kind of like lose attachment to the world and lose attachment to the body, lose attachment to one's own personality. One looks with indifference towards the entire gamut, both world and self, both external and internal, both past, present and future. One looks with indifference on it. Why, why is that? It's because one has realized by contemplating it for a long time that whatever it arise, whatever comes into being, and whatever sees, it it is always impermanent, has always been impermanent, will always be impermanent. There cannot come any come any new thing here in this world, or nor have there ever been anything that was not impermanent. Since this is the case, it is ultimately speaking unsatisfying because it it will be lost anyway, and therefore it is suffering. Whether it's pleasant or unpleasant now doesn't matter. It is suffering anyway, because it is always lost. And th therefore, there cannot be any substance in it in the external part, and there cannot be any self, any identity, any me, any ego, internal. So one kind of like detaches from it, say it's not me, it's not mine, it's not something I can hang my head on. This is not sadness. It's very realistic. It's very dry. The lack of involvement with both this part and that part 
the surf part and the world part. The lack of involvement with that, the lack of uh, engagement and entanglement in this whole gamut, this is released. Because it is released, it is felt as peace. So, Sankarupe Kanyana has the experience of peace. It's neither sadness nor gladness. It's an ultra dry, realistic evaluation on the absolute scale, absolute truth, Paramatma Satya, of what the world is and what this is. It corresponds to the next question How is equanimity different from nihilism or depression as opposed to general realization? The general realization. Uh, doesn't have any emotional component. So equanimity from uh, from Buddhist uh, mature maturity is not something that has an emotional component. It's not sad. It's not glad either. It's in between. It's neither sadness nor gladness. It's not felt as any kind of frustration. It is felt as a realization. It's felt as a way of looking at it, which is very realistic and very true, and one never forgets it. One never becomes in doubt whether there is any, uh, any ultimately speaking, any happiness out there in the world, or whether there is any happiness here to be found. One doesn't doubt it. One knows in advance, and it's not the case, because it's, imp- it's impermanent. This has nothing to do with nihilism. It doesn't take the purpose away from life. It doesn't say anything about uh, moral decay or uh, that there is no uh, good or bad like nihilism does. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. It just gives a very dry, realistic uh, evaluation of the world and way of looking at the world, which is not pessimistic because there is an alternative called nibbana. So it's not. It's not. It has nothing to do with depression. It has something to do with being realist in the ultimate sense. And that's this one, of course, should be. I hope this answers this question. It has no emotional complaint. It's neither sadness nor gladness. And it has a subjective feeling of peace because it knows in advance. Therefore, it doesn't react emotionally upon anything new coming up or anything new leaving or old leaving. It doesn't, doesn't react upon. It's only if you cling to it that when it leaves, there's sorrow. There's no clinging to it. Seeing well, how is there no clinging? Is see before it comes, already before it comes, one say, ah, uh, this is suffering because this is impermanent. So when it comes, doesn't there's not the taking up of it, the clinging to it, and so consequently, when it leaves, it's okay that it leaves. Doesn't matter. So one stays in equanimity, in indifference, in neither sadness nor gladness. Question 3. Can a person who has achieved stream entrance, Sutta Bhattimaka, break the five precepts? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. What is it that, that the stream entrant, a Sutta Bhatti, cannot do? They cannot kill their mother, their father. They cannot kill an arahat. They cannot make a Buddha bleed, nor can they cause schism in the Sangha. So this is just five heinous crimes where you are assured held destiny after having performed one of them. It cannot be repaired. So hell is sure if you do any of these five things. Killing of mother, killing of father, killing of arahat, causing a Buddha to bleed or causing schism in the Sangha that the Sangha split up. These the five unforgivable, heinous crimes. But everything else as a stream engine can do. They rarely do it, but they can be brought to it. So there are examples of it in, in the records. What is a stream entrant? Yes, he's a person who has at maximum seven lives left until Nibbana. So fairly close. The person is 25% enlightened. 25%. How have they come to be enlightened, 25%? There's three fetters, three mental chains that they have cut. What are they? these three mental chains? The first is Sakaya Dipti. What is Sakaya Dipti? Sa, me, my own. Kaya, 
form, group, ditti, view. The view that this body is me. The view that this consciousness, these perceptions, these experiences, these past memories, that this is me. This is what I am. This uh, stream doesn't say. They don't believe. They don't believe this body is me. They don't believe this mind is me. They don't believe their memories are theirs. Nor are they everybody else. They just don't identify with them. They say it's passing things. They come up and then they go away. It's they're ownerless. Both the physical part of it, the body, and also the mental part of it. Uh, the perception, the feeling, the experience, the mental constructions, hopes, intentions, plans, and the consciousness itself. So this group of five things, the five khandas, they do not say, ah, I'm sitting in the middle inside there. They have released it, say, ah, there's these five things, yes, that's true, but they are not me, they're not mine. I do not own them, I don't have them. I do not have a body. I do not have feeling. I do not have perception. I do not have mental construction. I do not have consciousness. Nor does anybody else have them. They are, they exist, yes, that's true, but it's passing states. They come and go. Not to be identified with, not to be clung to. This is a first bar, difficult one, because the identification happens all the time. People mostly identify with their body, their frame, their physical frame. Even though they can see their physical frame change from baby to old man with a long white beard, they still identify with it as the same, basically the same me, the same ego, the same identity. This the stream intent doesn't do. They have disengaged with these five phenomena, form, feeling, perception, mental construction and consciousness. They have detached from them. They <coughs> cut. Not me, not mine, not what I am. This is the first one. The next one is a skeptical doubt. Skeptical doubt is basically doubt in that the Buddhist enlightenment is perfect and real. And the rest follows from that. This they don't have. They never take another teacher. They come into a new life the last seven lives, they never take another teacher. Never. They're also independent. They don't need a teacher after having entered the stream. So if you put them on mass, uh, then, then they can be enlightened by themselves. They don't need any books or anything. They can do it by themselves. So they're independent. This is because they have realized this that the, the fact of the Buddhist enlightenment uh, under the Bodhi tree in Bulgaria uh, 2,500 years ago is a real historic event. It's a fact. It's not something they believe. It's not something that they have experienced for themselves to the degree of 25% or more. A little bit more, but not 50%. So, psychiatry, they have cut out. Uh, skeptical doubt, vichikitya, they have cut. So, these two things say they don't buzz around with anymore. They cannot be brought to take another teacher. So they're on the path. That's why they're called a stream entrant. They're on the path, on the stream to, that leads to Nirvana. Unambiguously. It never leads anywhere else. They cannot be reborn as a, a peta, they, a, a ghost. They cannot be reborn as an animal. They cannot be reborn as an angry, angry demon, a sura. They cannot be reborn in hell, Niraya. They cannot. They can only be reborn as a human or higher than human. But they can still break the five precepts. They can. This last last thing they have cut of the samyoyanas, of the fetters inside the mind, the chains, mental chains, is silabatta paramasa. What does that mean? It means attachment to rule and ritual. For example, that... Uh, that there are certain rules that should, you should keep, and th this is holiness in itself. Or uh, that uh, Buddha figures make you holy, or a white uh, thread around your uh, hand makes you holy, or a white thread around your neck makes you holy, or taking on white clothes makes you holy, 
all these things we, we, we call Buddhist culture, which doesn't actually in itself make mind more pure. They say have got their belief. They do not. So they, they often are fairly indifferent towards forms uh, of Buddhist culture. They do, do not ascribe to these various kind of trickery, like amulets and uh, all these uh, gimmicks there. They are, have, have become realistic with that what Buddhism is, is a praxis and a theory that has nothing to do with external forms, whether you have this close on or another close on, whether you follow this, follow this rule or that rule, it doesn't matter, it has something to do with an inner purity which is more genuine than that, that has nothing to do with rules and rituals. This they have got. So they have no, they are ex absolutely uh, free of any form of blind superstition in various kinds of uh, rituals. For example, singing all night long, singing uh, the Buddhist text in Pali uh, with, uh, uh, with flowers around, that that should make you holy, or that should protect the place where this ritual is performed. This they don't believe. They say, no, this is not the case. This is not true. And the people that have all these external things on them, have all these white threads, or have on a Buddhist robe or so on, they can be very, very, very impure in their mind and in their heart. Despite having these external signs of purity, they are not pure at all. They are the opposite. They can be hellgoers, still have on a Buddhist robe, still have white thread around their neck or make a, a various very, very sort of called sort of holy uh, rituals. But this doesn't fool the stream entrant because he or she has no silabhatta paramasa, attachment or clinging to rule and ritual. Enough with the stream entrant, I think, for this time. Uh, question four. If one forgives others' harms done to one, intentionally or in unintentionally, would that reduce or eradicate the effect of the karma? Uh, yes, indeed it will. On the condition that they actually ask for forgiveness. If they don't ask, then it doesn't. So they have to come and apologize. They have to see their own mistake and then uh, come and apologize. And then one forgives it. And then they are free, scot-free. They're back to zero. So they have no karmic accumulation if they get forgiveness for the person that they harmed, in directly or indirectly. If they come and ask for forgiveness and they don't get the forgiveness, then the mistake is on the person who has been harmed, who, who won't forgive. Because if they come and ask genuinely for forgiveness, then they sh you should also give them forgiveness. So there's two uh, kind of like, in the interplay between probabilities, there's two ego walls. There's an offender and there's a victim. And it's a conditional relation between these two that the karma is going, which is kind of like an echo between these two. And this echo, if this, if the offender asks the victim about forgiveness and get forgiveness, then there's no echo. The echo goes in zero. But they have to ask for it. Let's say one is a victim, then one can, uh, and one forgives. This doesn't affect the offender, but it forgives, it for affects the victim. The victim gets release, but the offender don't, unless they have apologized. So uh, the victim itself, if you, one has been offended, then if one forgives, it's very advantageous and very skillful to do, because then one uh, dismounts, disables one's anger towards any offender by forgiving them. Then one can go on scot free. They have to deal with their karma. That's their job. If one can bring them to uh, to ask for forgiveness and apologize, then of course that is the ideal case. Um, but that can be difficult. That can be difficult because maybe they don't want to admit that they have done anything wrong in the first place. Then how how to get them to apologize? 
Uh, this can this can be uh, close to impossible, but sometimes it can be done. By how? Yes, one can illustrate, talk about uh, when one has contact with them and and can talk with them if that's the case. Then one can talk about the same mistake made by somebody else. And then that this was a mistake. So not personalize it. Never use yourself as an example. Never use the opponent or whoever is a, as an example also. Use a third person, third person, a fourth person, someone that one is disconnected from, both oneself and the, the listener. So one teaching third person, always, always, always. I sometimes forget it, unfortunately. Uh, but this is the best because then that one this disables the emotional reaction, the opposition towards the message, by teaching it in third person. Say, if one does this and that, then this and that happens. But if then uh, the one, the person who has done this and that, apologizes and the other person uh, forgives, then that doesn't happen. This and that, then this person can see it, understand it, and then this understanding, after a while, can mature in that. Uh, now they can come and apologize because they understand both that they made a mistake and then the, it, they can repair it uh, by apologizing and uh, get forgiveness. So it's, it's the understanding if one can really tell what's the mechanics in it, then in third person, then they might have a chance to understand. Then might, one might save them if one can. But it's, it's difficult. It's an art in itself. Uh, to get people to apologize. It's also an art in itself to apologize yourself uh, to others, to see these mistakes you have done and then apologize to others. I do it every day <laughs> in all directions. In six directions I will apologize to those I have offended in the past. Uh, so in the four directions around, above as below. I apologize for whatever I cannot remember I have done. I also thank in the six directions to everybody who have helped me along the way, but I still cannot remember their services. So this is a good practice to do. Then one has a priori, even before the offense happens, uh, or before when one meets the offender, one has already forgiven it. And uh, one has said thanks to those in these directions, uh, to those before they come and give the gift. So this is very satisfying. And uh, it enables a deeper sense of peace. Because one becomes, as, as the ancient said, fearless from all directions. One doesn't fear that there come any offender from any of the directions from all the four directions. And this is very pleasant, uh, this fearlessness. So, yes, it's very, very good to forgive, and it's very, very good to apologize. And if one, somebody apologizes and one doesn't forgive, then one th the mistake is on the victim who doesn't forgive. Question five. How should one proceed in order to be reborn in a higher than human world, Manusa Loka, or in a higher sense world, Karma Loka, or even in the fine material, Rupa Loka, or in the immaterial, Arupa Loka? Uh, and how should one do, do that? Yes, uh, said very briefly. Uh, well, of course, uh, the first start with Sila, one should keep the five precepts. Then one should, we say, there's this uh, triad one can remember, dana, sila, bhavana. Dana is giving, sila is morality, bhavana is meditation or reflection or Buddhist studies. So uh, dana, sila in itself, where can that lead? That can lead to uh, the human world or the divine world, but not up to, up, up to the Brahma world the Ruba Loka. It can, cannot come out of Kama Loka. So, uh, morality and generosity can make divine on various levels. In Kama Loka, 
that is up to to, to new, uh, level 12. We are now on level human is level 5. But it cannot go before before that. There one has to do bhavana. One has to do meditation. And that that is because one has to make the mind the same as the level where one goes. So uh, the Brahman Loga usually will do one will do metta bhavana, meditation on infinite friendliness or infinite compassion or infinite uh, equanimity or infinite pity or infinite mutual joy mudita. This is the four Brahma Vihara one is practicing there. Then one can go and come in company with those who, who are continuously absorbed in that state, in universal friendliness, in infinite compassion, in endless mutual joy, and is in uh, imperturbable equanimity. There are the various levels of the Brahma Logas, of the, of the Brahmas. But there one has to do meditation. This doesn't say, first they, they also have to do dana and sila, but then they add up another component, a more higher component, by actually making their mind different from other human beings' mind. Namely, making them, for example, universally friendly towards others, all others, also any offenders. In order to go even higher than that, Aruba Luga, then one has to, uh, one has, I have to say, one has to, to reach a state of either first to the fourth jhana doing meditation. So one has to meditate to a significant high level. And one has to be at that level and that jhana absorption at the moment of death. Then one will be reborn in among these who has the same mentality, wh which is either jana, jana 1, 2, 3, or 4, rupa jana. They continue to stay. That, that entails that no Brahmas has even one single angry thought their entire life, which is uh, more than a billion years, which is one universal cycle. Uh, it's a quarter or it's a half or it's one universal cycle for the lowest ones. So this is many billion years, 100 billion years for one, one universal cycle, approximately. Yeah? Then do not have one single angry thought or are in opposition to anybody in this entire period. So this is worth remembering how they come there. So this is the Buddhist trick. He, he will, he, if he comes to a Hindu person, then he will typically teach these four Brahma Viharas, Mitta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upekka. Friendliness, pity, mutual joy, and equanimity. That they should practice one of those in their death moment, so to attain this state that they are uh, connected with that, in th right at the death moment. If, if one wants to go higher to an immaterial world, then one has to take, ev take it even higher. Then one has to, to practice these immaterial states, the immaterial jhanas, arupa jhanas, uh, while, while living. And furthermore, be, to, be, to be able to be in an arupa jhana at the moment of death, at the duty moment. The, the transmigration from uh, whatever level to whatever another level is determined by the properties of the mind, which is a matrix of uh, 89, principally speaking, 89 uh, different kinds of consciousness uh, paired with any of 52 mental properties or qualities. So where there can be different points in that matrix. And this will take the mind to that level, whatever uh, it will emerge at that, whatever level it has it is conditioned to at the duty moment, at the exact duty moment. Of course, this, this, then the ability to bring the mind uh, to whatever level 
at the truly moment is then determined by the, the the past life training, what's one training one has done in, in one's life, and before that in all, in prior lives also, and uh, what is how has the sila how has the morality the ethics is the remorse for example then it's very difficult to attain jhana if there's regret and remorse over some mistake one has done, or if have not given anything one has been a miser. One has done, none, does nothing good. If you look back and say, in, in, a, 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 in the deathbed, ah, what good did I do? And then, if there's nothing there, then then it's very difficult to attain a higher level because there's no joy of having done any good. And that's basically what brings higher, elevates because of this joy of seeing, ah, I, I did something that actually was fairly good. Uh, so I hope this answers these questions. For the lower uh, karma local levels up to local uh, level 12, uh, is dana, asila, generosity, and pure morality, five precepts at minimum, eight precepts at observance days, new moon, full moon. If one wants to go higher than that, then is jhana meditation uh, for rupa loka on the four brahma vihara. And if once wants to go in further higher than that, then is jhana meditation is on a very high level, on a formless level. So one can come in company, uh, and is trained in that state, has conditioned mind to that state. One wants to go uh, at that level. One wants to go and be in company with the other beings there that has that state permanently. While they are that at that state, I hope this uh, answers this question. Uh, question six. Is there any supreme power except the soul? Uh, there is no soul. That's uh, first I wanted to say from this uh, question. Uh, and there's neither any supreme power. So it's a no no. <laughs> uh, there's no soul. Soul is a kind of thing that, that one imagines that there's something inside consciousness that is the same that transmigrates from life to life. Or it's the same throughout your life. So the baby has the same soul as the old man that dies 60 or 70 years later. And the old man who is reborn as a new baby or as a cow or as a uh, bird or whatever has the same soul. No, there's no soul. There's no soul. There's no nothing in the same. It's the same. Neither mentally nor physically. So there cannot be any soul in that sense. Uh, neither can there be any supreme power. There's no supreme creator. Everyone can create and do it all the time. They form constructions by the interaction of the mind with the world. Uh, they form manifold constructions, but they are not creator of the world, and there's no supreme creator of the world. Some of the Mah Brahmas usually think that they are the supreme creators of the world, but they are not. They are not. When the world starts after the Big Bang, uh, after the Big Crunch, so so, and there's a new Big Bang, then uh, all the beings that has been at the Earth level, they have survived by doing br uh, Brahma meditation. Uh, they have survived on the Brahma levels. Then one of them falls down to a new level where there is no Earth, no planet. Then they stay there for a very, very long time. And uh, then they say to themselves, ah, it could be nice if there's some details here. And then uh, by, by itself, some, uh, the planets or the mass uh, starts to, the dust starts to uh, collect together uh, by gravitation. And so eventually uh, planets form. It takes several hundred million years. But they, their consciousness is very slow, so they don't experience it so, so long. They experience it long, but not so long. Then they say to themselves, ah, before I wanted something, details to come here. Now some details has come. Planets has been formed. So I made them. And that's a mistake. They didn't make them. When they come down here later on, these Brahma Devas, then they think there is a supreme power. When somebody else fall down in their company, then uh, this Brahma Deva who came there first, he tells his story to the other ones. When they come down here a uh, hundred thousand lives later, then they still had the tendency to to believe in this story, that, that there is a supreme creator of the universe. But that's not the case. That's not the case. 
It's just because they have been conditioned. Somebody have pulled their leg and told them a story. Why has this Brahman Deva? Because he believed in himself. But it's an er erroneous observation. He wants to some details to be there, and then they come after the day. Yes, but these two things might not be causally related. It didn't happen because he said he, they should happen. It happens more or less by itself, by gravitation. The last question is, what is Judy Chitta? How can one have a good Judy Chitta at the time of death in order to ha get a good life, Deva or human, in the next birth, if you have not attained Sutrapanna's status? status? If one is not a stream entrant, if one is not a noble, how can one affect this this judy chitta, which is the moment chitta mind, judy death, so it's a mind at the moment of death, the very last ultimate moment of mind, mental state, the very last mental state is determining the transmigration, the destiny of the transmigration, where it goes to, where mind falls out, falls out, manifests itself in, in connection with what form it will manifest itself in the next moment, right in the next moment. That's a duty moment. It's the last moment in this life, very last moment. You, here at Sri Lanka they actually had something called a pin porter. And that was, to answer the question, is one way of doing it. Uh, every time you do something good, you write it up in a book. Then when you lie, when one slide down and, and, and is close to death, then when the people come, uh, re usually relatives, uh, they come and read up of this book. But this is go it does, it's only gives sense to have a pin porter, a merit book, if one does anything good. Huh? So the first thing to have a, a good duty moment, a good death moment, is to do something good. There again, dana sila comes in. Generosity comes in. If you've given nothing away, help nobody else than yourself and your own family, uh, then it's very difficult to have a, a good duty moment. If the five precepts have been broken all along, then it's also very difficult because then there will be remorse and regret and the very last moment, looking back, having had sex with somebody else's wife, having killed animals, having lied, having taken bribe, uh, having committed fraud with taxation or otherwise, then this will come up and knock at the door at the duty moment, and this will determine it. However, one can see that uh, beings uh, here can have a good rebirth even though they, if they remember the good things they do. Usually, all, all karma is mixed. So all beings, also bodhisattvas, they have done both good and bad, and mostly no true things. So what will be the determinant in, uh, at the death moment? It's very difficult to say, but uh, if it's a good thing, it's a, if it's a good state, if it's remembering some of the good th one things one actually did, then it will be a good rebirth. But it's very difficult to, at the last, very last moment of life, to control the mind to such a degree that one can, one can uh, uh, determine the destination. Because all these moments are, of course, conditioned by the past life. What, ha what happened in this life? What happened in the youth? What happened in the middle of the life? And so on. All these all this conditioning is burning through all the way through to the duty moment. And this also goes for conditioning that ha happened uh, 10 lives ago and so on. There's also a conditioning, a probability, an influence uh, for mind to go into this corner or that corner. But basically it's, it's staying, it's, it's, it's staying with a positive mind. One can stay, for example, do meditation. Uh, approaching death, one can do meditation on infinite friendliness towards all beings, ha total harmlessness, or infinite compassion, pity, with all beings, because they are caught in samsara. And just like 
you are yourself and I and every all other beings. All mutual joy that they have done something good. And they will in the future they will experience the success and the elevation thereof. Mutual joy with that. Or equanimity. So one can take out any kind of meditation object and then try to stay with that through the Chudi moment. This one will take one to a higher place. Instead of, for example, the opposite, uh, being angry. Uh, angry will typically, if one is angry at the moment of death, imagine a soldier, for example, who has been wounded at the battlefield and see his enemy coming. He's very, very angry. He wants to kill his enemy. Then it's, it's either hell rebirth or a demon, Asura, uh, angry demon rebirth. While if it's ignorance, uh, confusion, doubt, uncertainty that is dominant in the Chudi moment, then it will be usually be a animal rebirth. Imagine a cow. If you look in the cow's eyes, it, it, its ignorance is is complete non knowledge of the situation is is evident. Huh? They become afraid for nothing, a small piece of plastic or anything, a candlelight even, and then the the cow run away because it doesn't know whether it's something dangerous or not. So if one can stay with any kind of non-ignorance, uh, non-greed, if, if greed, for example, is a, a greed for this house you're living in, or lying or dying in, or uh, greed for anything else, food, kind of like, then it, or money, uh, not having given anything away and uh, wants to go back and have uh, the credit card and the bank account and the car and so on, having a lot of longing to back to uh, the riches one has enjoyed in life. And then it's usually a hungry ghost rebirth because this this greed, this longing is, is very common or is the permanent mental state of the hungry ghost. But if it's generosity, uh, that is opposite of greed. It is if it's friendliness, which is the opposite of anger, and if it's knowledge, it's certainty, which is the opposite of ignorance. That is in the very, uh, which is the dominant mental state in the very last moment of life. Then the rebirth will be be good, will be divine, or at a high level of the human level. Of course. If he doesn't meditate before anything in life, then it's very difficult to do at the death moment because there can be physical pain and maybe panic and fear and so on. So it's now the preparation should be done. Both on the dana side, the giving side, the generosity side, at the sila side by the five precepts at minimum, and at the bhavana side, st studying the dhamma, reflecting on it, and doing meditation. It is now it should be done. It's now there is an opportunity to do it. In a deathbed, it is often very, t often t too late, because then it's, these physical symptoms of death and the fear and the panic will be so overwhelming that one cannot find a moment of peace on the hospital or whatever, uh, on the elderly care home, that one can attain a, a, a pleasant, harmonic, uh, happy, duty moment that will bring one to a pleasant, harmonic, and happy place, destination. So uh, it's, now, it's now the conditioning should be done. That was the last of questions for today. I hope this was uh, clear to some people's mind. That exactly 45, 44 minutes has gone, passed by, while this Dhamma on air number 12 passed along. Thank you for your attention. Namo Tasso Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasso Worthy indeed. Honorable and perfectly self-enlightened was the blessed Buddha. Have a nice day.